Good evening, Calvary. It's good to see you tonight. Uh, we're going to jump in together and uh, see if I can go really slow because I'm only up to chapter 12. So, Cindy's waving at her uh, entourage statewide. Or a country-wise, country-wise. Her groupies, yeah, from all over the United States. They're calling in and saying, can you just get rid of Dan and bring Cindy up? And uh, so... <laughs> oh, goodness sakes. Well, greetings to everybody who's watching online and uh, uh, had a good... Good celebration of life today for Mrs. Lois Jump. Uh, she was just a sweetheart of a woman, and uh, she is spending uh, her first week in heaven. So it's been nice to celebrate her life today. So anyway, let's have some prayer, shall we? Father, we love you. Thanks for your goodness. Good day. Good day of celebrating uh, the gift of people that you put in our life. And we just pray for... Uh, uh, Lois's family, as they will definitely miss her, Lord, and we just uh, pray uh, that uh, the gospel would, end up, would have went out today and that uh, maybe those who do not know Christ as their Savior, that they might contemplate coming to know Christ and, or at least thinking about their faith and uh, pray that you use my words to do that well, Lord, for you today. And we just pray that you be with us tonight as we continue to study uh, Genesis. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you help us to keep learning uh, things not only about Noah, but more importantly about ourselves and about the world that we live in. Uh, because Jesus was very, very clear that in the end days, uh, they're going to be like the days of Noah. And uh, so a lot of things to learn and a lot of things to apply to our life. So bless us, Lord, as we go into your presence. Uh, we ask your Holy Spirit that he would reveal things to us anew, that he would open up the secrets to us and... Uh, Bring revelation to us tonight, we pray. We just thank you for gathering us together. And we've got a lot of uh, Floridians that are coming back home uh, in the next couple weeks. So we pray, Father, that uh, you would um, bless them in their journeys. Folks from Arizona and other parts of the U.S. where it's a little bit warmer, Texas. Uh, we just ask for journey mercies as they come back home, Lord. I was encouraged today just to meet um, a couple that spends the winters in Florida and and they were just saying, you know, how good it is just to be home and uh, to be back in church. And uh, so we're just thankful for that. So bless, Lord, we pray all these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said with me, please. Thank you, church. Appreciate it. All right, we are in uh, chapter 9, please. We're looking at verses 1 through 17. Chapter 9, 1 through 17. Hey, let's take a run from Genesis 1, shall we? We're just going to start at the beginning. I told Jeff I'm only in chapter 12, so I'm going to really stretch this stuff out until you guys are bored with me. But uh, just, it's always good to kind of get your bearings on things. Chapter 1, just creation. It's how God created. Two, creation, but in particular, man. That's the distinguishing mark. I say that because... Liberal criticism, liberal, liberal critics will always go to chapter 2 and say there's a literary inconsistency here. He told us what he created. Why is he telling us again in 2? Therefore, it cannot be right. Moses didn't write the book of Genesis. And we go, you just don't understand it. Chapter 1 was the overview. Chapter 2 is the specifics. How did God create man, woman, all right, uh, work environment, those types of things. Chapter 3, fall. Chapter 4. First, first murder, first plural marriage, first sacrifice, Deb's got that one, there's a lot of firsts in that, but those are three, first, first uh, fratricide, first killing of one's brother, first sacrifice that we see of outside of God doing it with, Cain, uh, with Adam and Eve, third, first plural marriage with Lamech, chapter five, genealogy, but more importantly, it is the it is the aft outworking of chapter 3. It is where we get, and he died, and he died, and he died. Six, Noah, introductions. Seven, flood. Eight, 
landed. Eight landed, nine. Hey, welcome back, brother. It's Dave Swaggerts. Yay. Dave will be standing all night. Uh, but, man, we're so glad to see you, brother. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, six introduction to Noah, seven flood, eight land, nine. Get me out of here, please. That's nine. Actually, nine is going to be rainbow. It's going to be promises, all right? They're out of the ark. That's how we ended with eight. Eight is, and God basically opens the door, and everybody goes out, and Noah makes a sacrifice unto God. Do you remember that? He takes the clean animals, the birds in particular, does a burnt offering, and it was a sweet-smelling sweet fragrance unto the Lord. And that's how we ended with eight. So that's where we're heading into nine, all right? Good. Verse one, what was the blessing? Verse one, then God... Bless Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. I am certain that all of the wives enjoyed that promise. It's like you're going to have to have 100 babies each uh, to get this thing going again. All right. So answer, God reestablished what? He established the original design for humankind which comes out of the comparative 1 and 28. They, where was, who, who was given that original blessing? Adam and Eve were given that original blessings in 1 and 28. So he's just basically re-establishing um, that original plan for mankind. Uh, and now it's going to be through Noah, his wife, and his three sons. How is the current globalist climate change anthropological anthropology going against God's design and how is it actually bringing a curse how about that for a question <laughs> and this is why I have to keep working on PowerPoint and new lessons for everybody because 10 years ago guess what I wouldn't have asked I wouldn't have asked that question why because it wasn't relevant 10 years later this is the top button all right so how is the current globalist climate change anthropology going against God's design and how is it actually bringing a curse? Answer. Less people. Guess who the problem is? People are problem. So we need to get rid of the people in order to save the planet. Do you see how that goes against God's design? Why did God create the planet for the people? They have this completely turned over on its head. So it's actually going against it. So all of the legislation and things that are trying to restrict. By the way, if you've paid attention to uh, uh, what would be the category for this? Global economics. If you've paid attention to that you know that there is a serious crisis that they cannot admit or else it would undo this. What's the crisis? They're not reproducing. So guess what China's in trouble with? There's too many men and not enough what? There's, there's no reproduction going on. They're in crisis, economic crisis. Ireland. I was in Ireland, when did I teach in Ireland? Uh, 2005, four. I was teaching in Ireland 20 years ago. 20 years ago, Ireland knew that they were having a problem. So their legislation changed and they started paying people to have babies. Because they knew that in a generation, 20 years, guess what would happen? No support. Guess what the U.S. is having a problem with right now? Uh, well, well and, and that is the positive thing about immigration is you have an influx of people coming in because without that, the economics of it would be what? I'm looking around and guess what I don't see here tonight? 
young people. And guess who's going to be paying our Social Security and <laughs> our Medicare and Medicaid? It's got to be people who are working and, who, and who's going to be taking care of us. Ex absolutely, Chris. Who's going to be the ones that are going to be the caregivers for us? And when people stopped having children, uh, you, you, do you see the connection here, brothers and sisters? Yeah. Reproduction is, is not just a mandate. It's a necessity for the well-being of humanity. It just is. So, and, you know, one of the things, uh, I don't know if Bill picked up on this when we were in Kenya. You know, those people have virtually very little, but when they have a baby, it is a celebration. You know, they don't know, they're not thinking, how am I going to take care of this kid? It's another mouth to feed. Yeah, it is, but they're not thinking that way. They're thinking, God has blessed us with another child. And uh, I just think, Wow. The inversion on this thing is, uh, is interesting. I don't know. Yeah. Can you remember, uh, and Heidi, you can probably speak to this. Uh, I can remember growing up, we all knew who the Catholics were. They had 15 children. You know, they just did, man. They just had kids. Um, and it was a great blessing, not only for the families, but for the church itself. I don't even know if that's part of it anymore so it's like I've got 2.3 children <laughs> it's like where'd the other seven tenths go but I don't know but the whole society has has moved inward on itself it's not about reproducing and caring for others it's just about you know living living free and um, so I think this is it's not an inconsequential question I think it's of, of great importance because it's a political agenda and it's going against God's design. And if you go against God's design, it's not a blessing, church. It, it, is, it is indeed a curse. Absolutely. I... I gave Jeff a book. Um, it was about a, oh, Jeff, what was that? It, I, you haven't gotten to that probably back end. Um, he had 16 children. Uh, yes, he does. He has to read the book because it's not part of the story. It just tells you how many people. But you had 16 kids. But back in the 1800s, 1700s, you had 18 kids because half of them died before they were 10. And you needed the other 10 to help you with the, with the work. And so it was out of necessity that you did that. And uh, as we moved from an agrarian to more of a, an urban center with factories and those types of things, I mean, that was a whole, that's a whole another conversation. But my, my, I think I have a couple answers to this one. Number one, it's trying to church, what's the key word? It's trying to depopulate the earth based upon a faulty view of, and in missiology they teach us this in my doctoral program. This was a big issue that we, ha we had to wrestle with because most of us were looking at either being missionaries or like myself, I was looking at teaching overseas theologically, which meant I had to understand the cultural nuances of how they viewed the theological precepts and concepts. That, that was my my um, my study and they talk to you over and over again about um, uh, lim the limited good it's called the limited good or the limited resources the limited good or the limited resources says say this there's only so much so guess what you have to do we learned this in covid with toilet paper yeah yes there are people who do not need to buy toilet paper for the next 30 years because they still have it in their basement of 8,000 things. So Y2K, does anybody remember that? Yeah, absolutely. I, we still know people that have, you know, 400 pounds of rice down in their basement and uh, fuel for 30 years. Uh, you, you get scared about those things and it presses in on that view because we're, we're all scared about that stuff. It's a faulty view of that. There is enough resources for everybody. Do you know that? There is. 
God, God produces. Do you know how much food we produce just in the U.S.? My goodness sakes. We feed half the world. <laughs> so, well, people are starving. It, it, it's, I don't know if you've been following the stuff going on in Haiti right now, but I, I did some, uh, there was some feeds that I was listening to, theological feeds that were connecting things, but politically, you know, we've had past presidents that have sent that half island country billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. Guess where it went? It went, it went, Somewhere else besides feeding people and building hospitals. So it's not about the limited good. It's about the sinfulness of mankind to hoard and to use it for evil, wicked purposes. And all God's people said, please. That's the problem. Um, it's not the fact that, there's, that God hasn't created a planet where we have enough resources to feed everyone. Um, it's just not true, all right? But that's called the limited good theory or the limited resource theory. And if you study in depth on missiology, that's going to come up a lot. All right. Uh, it's actually trying to limit the population so it's easier to do what? Control both people and resources. Do you remember that lady I played? Uh, she worked for the Department of Agriculture out in California. She did land surveying. I don't know if you remember that video. But she, she left that and she exposed that the U.S. government was trying to get to buy land through uh, Jeff politically taking land because it serves <laughs> eminent domain. Through eminent domain, they're basically stealing land for one purpose, which was to bring rural people, church, into the inner city the, the, to urban, and because once you get people here, it's a whole lot easier to do what with them? To control them. That's exactly what it is. So you see that plan. So when anybody tells you there's not enough, that people are starving. It's like in Gaza. If you've seen stuff on Gaza, they've got plenty of food in Gaza. They just don't want you to know they have plenty of food. By the way, we've spent how many billions of dollars in Gaza? Guess where it went? Weapons, pol politicians, terrorists, it never goes to the people that needed the food. And so, yeah, it's the same thing here in the United States. Abuse, uh, you know, things not getting where it needs to go. Uh, and we don't want to get in the political side of this discussion. What I need you to try to understand, though, is what we're talking about is something in Genesis that's speaking into this issue. Does that make sense? That's what we're talking about. All right? So, so people are not the problem. People are blessing to God. All right? Um, he's, Jesus didn't die for the earth. He died for people who have souls. That's who he died for. Does he care about the planet? Of course he does. He will redeem that to some extent when he comes back per Romans 8. Answer two, it's also bringing a curse on the earth by restricting man's diet. Uh, what country was that? I think it was Sweden that the government started to restrict farmers from raising cattle. What was it? The Netherlands. Do you remember that? They got some pushback on that now. Because it's like, wait a minute, this is absurd, you know? Cows are not causing the planet to die, all right? It's just people are, people are thinking, they're finally saying, they're, they're finally saying, this is absurd. Our politicians are idiots. They're not trying to save the planet, they're trying to do what? They're trying to control people, and that's exactly what it is. It's bringing a curse on the earth by restricting man's diet, by restricting where he may live, by restricting the use of that which God provided for us to provide for those in need, all in the name of worshiping, yeah, Gaia, uh, which is the mythological uh, Mother Earth. 
and that's the difficulty of that. By the way, Paul talks about this. I don't pr- think I put this in my notes. But he's talking about this in the end times. I think it's 2 Timothy 3. Someone can check, m- check me out on that. I can't remember the parking lot right now. But Paul t- wrote to Timothy and he said, you can tell false teachers because they teach you to restrict things like you can't marry or they restrict and say you can't eat certain foods. The, 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 uh, protas- the um, protasis of that, the, the second part of that phrase says that for which God gave to us to be thankful for. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a very demonic uh, agenda that is going against something we, we learn not only in Genesis 1 and 28, but we're now learning it again in uh, Genesis and 9. Verses 2 and 3. Um, what changed? Verse 2. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky, on in every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. Yeah, you can eat animals, which is why they're afraid of you now. (laughs) Well, at, at this point, we don't have the dietary restrictions because that will come in Leviticus. All right. So right now, everything is everything. You can eat it. They could ham on each Easter, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there, uh, but not yet. We don't know that, Steve, but we'll be getting there. I know, but we're only in three. Don't rush me, man. Come on. Come on, Steve. Steve, that's why this is going so fast, you know. Gee. <laughs> Just for that, we're going to go back to Genesis 1 again. So. so something changed, all right? And it's not just that you can eat meat. I need you to come out of that and talk to me about what changed. Yeah, it's right up front. The fear and dread of you will fall on the beasts of the earth, which infers what? They, they weren't afraid of you before. Uh, they coexisted and they didn't sense you or any threat. It's sort of, sort of like the deer off on Spencer Park going across when they look at you and go, what are you doing? I'm here first. Uh, you stop for me. Or, or eating all your flowers out of your backyard. Exactly right. Uh, absolutely. S- yes, Mary, please. Uh, we started fearing the animals at the same time as a good DNR officer friend said to me in Alpena, Michigan. When you go out in the woods, know that whatever you're hunting may be hunting you back. And uh, I think that's a good point. And so the, the larger conversation is we're at enmity, at enemy with each other. So not only are we looking to eat them for food, but guess who else is looking to eat us for food? Uh, they're, they're looking to be carnivores as well. This is an amazing point to me because this is a real drastic change, isn't it? Um, I think we get an indication in later in the Old Testament in... Oh, where is that? First Kings. There's two other places uh, where that is that. It has to do with Jonah, actually. One, it has to do, let me get my thoughts so that I can run the train here. So if, ladies, when you're studying Jonah chapter one, Jonah thought he could do something. What was it? He could run from God, which meant he believed that God could be contained geographically in one location. So there was a locative argument about deities. This is the God of this, this is the God of this, and they can't move out of those things. When the Assyrians came into Israel, 
and deported people, um, God did a couple things. Number one, he made the wild animals get too bad in that area. Does that make sense? So they had to send people back so that they could contain the wild animals, basically. So it's a population control issue. They also sent people back, especially priests, because in that particular sense, and I can't remember where that's at just offhand. It's not something I memorized and can't bring back up. But they said, can you please send us a priest back to this area because we don't know what the God of this land desires. Why? Because they were being eaten by wild animals and they thought that was a curse. So all of that kind of fits with this a little bit. So there, I think perhaps, Chris, the, the eco-balance is happening at some point because you don't want so many of something. And so this natural then... Uh, the population control was of the, was of the beasts, but he used man and beast to do that population control. I mean, we saw this in northern Michigan as well. Uh, there were too many wolves, so guess what they did? They hunted the wolves, or they chased them and moved them all the way up to the UP and up into Canada. Well, when they brought the wolves out of the northern part of Michigan and the UP and chased them up into Canada, guess what happened to the deer population? It exploded until they had a deer population problem. So the DNR, in their brilliance, decided, guess what we need to do? We'll bring the wolves back down. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know, government. My goodness sakes, it's amazing anything gets done properly. All right? So answer to this, uh, our relationship with the creatures becomes, church, it becomes adversarial. All right? It's no longer friendly anymore. Uh, in particular, those who are wild. We still have domesticated animals, cows, sheep, those types of things that are not uh, life-threatening to us per se. Two, our diet is extended now um, to include what? Yeah, it's now, uh, you're, you can now be a carnivorous person, all right? And Deb gives thanks for that every single day. No, she does not. She is a Genesis 1 gal. She eats salads. I'm the one that is blessed and keeps the population control. Uh, and oh, meat eater. yes, ma'am. God designed me to eat meat. It's, I can't help it. I'm not going to apologize for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> prior, Prior to this, humankind was, in fact, church, vegetarian. Yeah, chapter 1 and 29, and we just saw that, that God gave them the greens. He gave them greens, nuts, fruits, uh, those types of things that in actuality are very, very good for you. All right, note, it's well documented that, church, I will concede a vegetarian diet is the healthiest, and that animal protein is in part the cause of many of our ailments. So one must ask, why did God now allow for us to do that? He did not want people living to be 939 years of age. You remember that in Genesis 6? My spirit will not always dwell with man. He'll dwell with him for hundred and... 20 years it is my next question thank you dearest a so Genesis 6 and 3 his days will be 120 years it is one of the ways God reduces what he reduces the lifespan of human beings that and uh, grizzly bears eating people out in the middle of the woods um, it's just how we don't live long too it allows God to Chris, we talked about this a little bit, to manage the population of the creatures within a safe limit for both them and for humanity. And you have to remember, in Genesis, what did God command Adam to do? Uh, well, he named them, but before that, he have authority and dominion to manage, manage. Manage means what? 
Uh, not so much uh, control is that, Danny. I would, I, would, I would say yes to that, but that's a little bit of, more of a negative word for me right there. Uh, it's okay. It's a great answer. I'm just not the one I was looking for. When I manage something, it is for the benefit of, of, of whatever I'm managing, all right? If I manage an apartment complex, <laughs> I'm a slumlord. Yes, and I only want the money. So, yeah, that's true. All right. So, yeah, that was a great realtor question there, Cindy. Thanks for answering that for me. So it allows God to manage, uh, to, um, to oversee appropriately. That would be a good word for that. The population of his creatures within a safe limit for both them um, and for humanity itself, all right? Three, there's a post-flood change that's not prophesied here, but soon became a reality, and that is, church, that... All God's creation becomes adversarial towards each other in varying degrees from the greatest predator on the earth and sea to the, ah, we get the first, we seldom think about the second. I don't know about you, but I don't know of anybody that's died of a bear attack in Logansport. I have, however, heard of a lot of people who have died from things that I can't see. Would you agree, Doc? Phew, thank you. Doc and I are on the same page on this now. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the greater threat actually that changed in Genesis 9 was something that we couldn't see. I think there was an adversarial reaction that happened in the microbial world. Uh, the Bible doesn't specifically talk about it, which is what I'm indicating, but the reality of it, it is there. We now have diseases. We've got all kinds of micro things that enter our bodies that cause disease and decay and kill us. So, Doc, thoughts? Yes. Right. Yeah, Doc was saying that Walter Reed, uh, the Army Medical Facility, uh, the, the vast majority of people don't die from military injury. They die from diseases. In fact, if you think about the Revolutionary War, more people died of what? Uh, of scurvy. They died of cholera. They died of typhus. than ever were killed in battle. I mean, uh, that's happened to all the, if you look at all the wars, the great wars in Europe, the vast majority of those people died not because they got shot. They died because they got sick of something. And so um, I just think that's fascinating to me as I kind of put this together. Uh, so the micro, micro, microbial bacteria that once was beneficial now ends up doing what? Yeah, it kills us. And of course, as we get older, we all have to try to take pre and post our, our probiotics because we want good bacteria rather than bad bacteria. We all know the language. We just never think about, when did that thing change? Can I offer that? This is my suggestion. I think it happened here. I think, I think it happened post-flood in chapter 9 when everything environmentally changed and things become ad adversarial from that outwardly also but that that happens inwardly as well bill do you have a thought please yeah there's a reversal that comes at the end by the way so uh it, the millennial kingdom that comes up the child will play in the hand of the poisonous snake, that once again the um, the lion doesn't eat flesh; it eats straw, hay, like the ox does. So we've got a reversal back to Genesis chapter one that takes place there. Also, this you have to remember: when in the millennial period, what also reverts back to Genesis one two? Long lifespan, Jeff. Absolutely. 
when a child, if a person dies at 100 years age, they're going to be considered a child. So in my understanding of that, guess what even is then reversed? Not only the, 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 the creation, the creatures, but I have to believe that God in some way reverses the microbial issue as well. Would, that, would you uh, agree with me on that? Yeah, I think that happens as well as we think through that. So, Chris, thought? Sure. As evil as people were. Well, anyway. Yeah. I'm thinking. So, what's your thought of why God did this all? I mean, he, he could do well the way he did it, right? Just by being God. Does he just show us, hey, I'm trying to start over. It didn't work because you guys are so bad. Or, or I mean, it, did you ever think about that? Um, Chris is. Chris's, knew, yeah. Well, they were just go back sure. To what they were. Chris's question is if God knew that the flood would not resolve the wickedness issue of humanity, then why did he do it in the first place? Answer. I like Danny's because he's God. All right, answer, done, we're over. What else? What other thoughts? Um, to give man. Another chance? I, I would accept that. It didn't work. It was his judgment at that time on that group of people. And I, I think, I'm always thinking about, especially in Genesis, because we've already picked up on this. Genesis, in Genesis, God does this. But God never does this for this. God always does this because, church, There's, there's here, there's the end of the story, Doc, the prophetic mountains. There's, there's an end here. Peter does this. Remember in 2 Peter chapter 3? We'll, we'll talk about that in my, I have a 2 Peter series coming up um, late spring, early summer, into fall. In 2 Peter 3, I'm sorry. <laughs> 2 Peter 3, it says, there are, in the last days, there will be scoffers who come scoffing and say, where is his appearing? Because it's been, it's been years and he's not come back. So why don't you just give up on this notion of the second coming of Christ? And Peter immediately says, but long ago, there was this thing called the flood. I mean, he just goes through the judgments of God saying, if you don't think that Jesus is going to show up and do that again, except he's not going to use water. In fact, it was prophesied by John the Baptist. I baptize you with water, but he will come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's going to torch this place. Right at the beginning of his ministry, John the Baptist lays that whole plan out. So, Chris, I think it's a shotgun answer. I don't think there's a single one. Um, we'll just go with Danny's. God's God, and he can do whatever he wants he here. So, Yeah, he will still be giving people a second chance until the very end of, of days. And so, I don't know. It is his mercy, absolutely. But I also think it's a cautionary tale. I think it's always someone... I wonder if Noah and his kids and grandkids, I wonder if Grandpa constantly retold the story and said that's why we don't become really evil because God did that once he can do something else really really bad again now we're going to see that he's not going to flood the world again but we do know he's going to judge it again and so maybe that's the purpose maybe it's to give us a marker to say God did that once and he said he's going to do it again He's just going to do it in a different way. So I, that's a great question, Chris. I, I just don't know if I've got a singular answer for it. I think it's multi. Question four, uh, verse four, question, what was the restriction? Abstain from blood. Thank you, Steve. Yes. I was thinking Steve was going to say no medium or no rare steaks. 
Grover would argue against that because he would tell us that that's not the same blood. He always did that, didn't he? He always reminded us that that's not what that meant. Did Grover like rare steak? (laughs) Oh my gosh, but you must not eat meat that has church, its life blood in it, uh, still in it, yeah. You must not eat meat that has its life blood still in it. Abstain from eating or drinking, by the way, blood. Don't do it. Yeah, it's, it's the life issue. It's the first time we get that. And then in Acts 15, this is the first church council. Uh, that's when Paul and Barnabas uh, showed up at Jerusalem because some Judaizers or who claimed to be followers of Christ showed up and started telling people that you, especially men, you've got to be circumcised in order to be f- saved. You still have to do that. It was a Jesus plus gospel except Christ, but you've also got to do all these other things. Um, So early, if you would, please, Seventh-day Adventist theology. A lot of that Seventh-day Adventism has moved to more evangelical, um, if you know some of those teachers. So you have to be careful about that anymore because a lot of that stuff has moved. Armstrongism used to be cultish. They've moved towards uh, uh, evangelicalism too. You just have to pay attention to teachers. All right, 15. So this is the first church council. And they have to deal with this issue of do we have to, are we going to make the Gentiles obey the law like we Jews did? Now the answer from Peter was what? I'm a Jew and guess what? (laughs) We couldn't do it either. So why do you think the Gentiles have to do something the Jews could never do as well? Both Peter and Paul argued against this. So, yes, Doc, please. Yes. Uh, in Acts chapter 10, uh, with Peter and Cornelius, he sees the, the uh, picnic basket come down with all the foods he's not supposed to eat. And Peter says, I'm not doing that. And God says, that's not what I'm talking about, Peter. I'm talking about the Gentiles. But you're going to go ahead and eat some bacon too. It's okay. All right. So James, who is the uh, chief leader of Jerusalem, gives us this then uh, final verdict. It's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols. So Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. If somebody invites you over for supper and you've got a new believer and they find out that they went to the market and bought meat that was just offered to an idol and the new believer goes... I'm not eating that stuff. That's sinful. Well, then just don't eat the meat until he gets mature to know that idol is nothing. Go ahead and have some good prime rib. It's okay. All right? So it's it's a maturity issue. Abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from the meat of strangled animals. Because if you grow up on the farm, you know that's not how you kill things. You kill it. And you drain it from the blood, all right? Common practice. From the meat of strangled animals and from blood, all right? The reason they said this is because all three of those things would have been an affront to Jewish people. So if you're trying to reach your Jewish neighbors, guess what you don't want to do? Yeah, you don't want to offend them intentionally by especially serving them food that would be highly offensive to them so let's not do that, all right? So uh, it's part of that. Chris, please. Yes, it's not John's brother, James. Executed, yeah. James got his head cut off very early. Yeah, this is, this is, this is James, the br- half-brother of Jesus coming up, all right? So... Uh, verse 5, question, what, stay, what stayed the same? And there's a reference, reference here with 4, 11 to 15. 5, and for your life blood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from, I, I, I've always found this very interesting, from a, moral, from a morality side of things. I will demand an accounting 
from every animal and from each human being too I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being I love word orders that always p I pay attention to it I would have thought that what would have been first man I would have thought that he would have addressed mankind first hey don't kill each other but he didn't he addressed animals first then he addressed persons. What's the significance of that? I don't know. I just find the ordering important as I look at that. So I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Human beings are still here. They're still high. But anything that kills at that person, whether it is an animal or another person, banking term. That's what that is in Hebrew. It means what? You're going to have to reconcile that. <clears throat> yeah, the, 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 uh, even uh, your brother's blood speaks from the ground as a testimony against you, Abel's blood. Which brings me up to an interesting question, Doc, as we get through this. So let me just get through the answer, and then I think I've got some questions that regard to that. So there was still a church, it's a debt to be paid for taking the life of another person, right? This gets really messy, uh, not only because we have already studied four, chapter 4, but it gets really messy uh, through the rest of the Old Testament and then in particular in the New. It's like, what do we do with this? Okay. Uh, yes. So Steve said, is this where uh, Christians in particular get in trouble with capital punishment, for example? Right, so the Ten Commandments, if you understand the, the Hebrew, uh, thou shalt not kill, it doesn't mean kill, it means thou shalt not intentionally murder someone. Does that make sense? Yeah, which is why I have an, a, a problem with abortion. It's intentional murder of a person. So now that we know the science of that, the, the, once again, the conversation's changed. Now it's not about killing. It's about, well, it's really not a person. Come on. All right. So we've got enough science to, to do that, take care of that argument as well. So here's what 4 says. All right. Remember chapter 4? Three things. Deb added a third. What is in 4? First, murder. First, sacrifice. First, plural marriage. So there's your firsts. So we're going to address that first murder here. All right. Now you are under a curse, speaking to Cain, and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, I will no longer, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you're driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. That's a locative understanding of God. By the way, it goes back to Jonah. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will... Huh. That's interesting, isn't it? We talked about that. So let me put this in sort of a, a mathematical theorem thing. All right. Cain kills Abel. God to Cain. Fill in the blank. What is that there? Punishes Cain. Cain is an outcast, but now Cain is worried about someone killing him. So he's worried about the horizontal ramifications of what he did with his brother and God is not in that same space, is he? That's the interesting thing about this whole conversation as we get in Genesis 9 because Genesis 9, it seems like God's changing something or is he? So what's connected to the blood? Life, 
Who's held accountable for those loss? Whoever or whatever takes the life, animal or, or human, it doesn't matter. Note, this does not establish animal morality, but rather affirms the theological premise found in the next verse. What is the new rule? Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. And that's going all the way back to where, church? 1 in 26. Let us create man. Let us create him in our image. Male and female, God created them. It goes all the way back to the beginning. God is recognizing and bringing something up again for us to grab a hold of, all right? Lex talionis is Latin. It means what? It means, lex means law. Talionis means, means retaliation. The law of retaliation. Or, I've given it to you. Eye for an eye. Eye for an eye. Tooth for a tooth. Nose for a nose, ear for an ear, whatever it is. And, by the way, that lex talionis is going to come up again in the study in Leviticus. Uh, for example, if you have a slave and you knock out his tooth, guess what you have to do to the slave then? You have to let him go for the tooth. Does that make sense? Do you see all those principles coming up here right at, at the beginning in Genesis 9? So it's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Lex talionis is just the Latin. Lex is, is law. Talionis is retaliation. It's the law of retaliation. And by the way, when you get to Leviticus, it also sets up 10 cities. Cities of sanctuary. Cities of sanctuary or cities of refuge. If you unintended, unintentionally killed someone, you could do what? You run to those cities for the courts, all right? Or until the high priest dies, and then you can come back home. Why? Because in that culture, if you killed my brother, whether it was an intentional or not, because of the honor system, I had to do what? I had to go kill that person. Life for life. Eye for an eye. It doesn't matter if it's right or right. If you went to the city of refuge or sanctuary city, you couldn't do that. because the, Unless they left the city to find their donkey. Uh, then, then they got killed. All right, so that's part of that. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, please. Animal morality. Yeah, it doesn't mean that animals have a sense of right and wrong. Some people think dogs do, they don't. Dogs are just simply responsive animals. If you yell and scream and smack a dog, he's going to find out pretty soon. I probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's reactionary. It's not morality, all right? Morality comes with humanity because we're made in the image of God who is a moral <coughs> being. But animals are not moral beings. They, they act off of instinct. They act off of response. They are still held accountable that's one of those Levitical laws. If I've got a bull out on the farm and it constantly gets loose and kills people, guess who's going to be held responsible for the blood? The owner of the bull. Put the owner to death and the bull because he knew better. He's responsible for the blood on, that was shed on that. So I hate to bring in Leviticus because I know that's a real boring book to most, but it has a precedent that's all the way back here in Genesis chapter 9. So, yeah, good question, Chris. Uh, what's the difference compared to 4, 23, and 24? God punished Cain by banishment, but not by killing him. And God now ordains man to exact the death penalty. There's a change. Hmm. What's the theological premise against the murder of man? Yeah, Tim, I'm sorry. Well, 
Well, capital murder has to do with justice. It has to do with a community saying, this person is guilty of killing another man, and for the sake of the community, that man will be put to death. The problem, I, I can't remember who wrote this on Lex Talionis. If we all practice Lex Talionis, we would just have a world of blind people. We would be putting out each other's eyes all the time. I mean, it's just the way it is. It never worked. It was a system set up to navigate this particular. Um, but wasn't it actually a really limit? You know, I mean, if you poke out my eye, I'm going to kill you. Yes. It's like the worst you could do is right. to poke out your eye. Yes. Yeah, I, it, it was a, a more just system than we found in Genesis 6, which we don't find any justice. In fact, if you go back to 4 in Lamech, he not only had two wives, but we also have something else in that chapter. Remember he said this? A young man tried to attack me, and I killed him. And then it says, if God made this curse on Cain, uh, how much more, you know, coming from me to protect myself. So we would get, we're starting to get all these laws coming in at us. Nine, I think, Steve, I think you're probably correct. There, there's at least some sort of community mechanism now to prevent the onslaught of wickedness, which is, is what in our current culture is causing a lot of us grief because it doesn't seem to be that the laws are being applied, does it? They're not enforced. You know, they just keep making more laws and more laws. Um, Deb and I saw this evening Kokomo uh, City Council passed a resolution on homelessness, um, homeless people setting up camp in public places. And after I heard the resolution, I went, I told Deb, I said, that was worthless. They had so many addendums to it. It's like, it didn't solve anything except made their political opponents happy with them because they made some legislation that appeared like they were taking care of the homeless people without kicking them out. It did absolutely nothing. It really didn't. It just, it didn't. So I think, Steve, you're probably right. Now we're getting this, we're getting boundaries now. However harsh they may appear to us, there are at least boundaries in comparison to Genesis 6 when there wasn't any. So what's the theological premise against the murder of man? Answer, church. Yeah, the image of God, absolutely. He's made in the image of God, the imago Dei. That's who he is, all right? Am I at a good stopping place or what do I need to do? I don't have my notes in front of me. I just go. Um, I'll just go one. I'll, I'll, I'll go for a couple more minutes. Um, how is this different than, than killing an animal? Uh, the animal is considered food. Yeah. This is what I had a problem with with a lot of my hunter friends in northern Michigan. And if you're watching, please don't send me hate mail. Okay? I, I can establish my point. I'm against trophy hunting. I don't, I don't believe God establishes and approves of sport killing. I just don't think he does. Now, if you want to go out there and shoot you a nice, you know, uh, what's those uh, white sheep up in Montana? Can't think they get the really nice horns, but it doesn't matter. I, I don't mind if you go up and you shoot them, but then you give the meat to people to eat. I, I don't mind that. It's not wasting but if you go up and shoot something, cut the head off and leave the thing out there, I got a problem with that. I, I don't think that's what God intended for us to do. I think, it's, I think it's designed to feed and to do exactly what Genesis 9 does. And you can argue against with me on that. I don't care. I really don't care. <laughs> so, so how is this different than killing an animal? An animal is not made in the image of God. An animal is not made in the image of God. It doesn't mean that they don't have value. That was my point in that discussion that I preempted this with. I value animals to the extent that I do not agree with trophy 
killing. I don't. All right? I don't agree with abusing your animals. And I'm a farmer. And I hated that when PETA, you know, people, uh, what was the other, what was the acronym we used to say as farmers? PETA, P-E-T-A. Yeah, people eating tasty animals. I always wanted a bumper sticker on my tractor uh, with that. I, s- I, I wanted to say to those people, do you honestly believe that as farmers, we abuse our animals? We take the best care of them because it's, an ex- it's, it's, it's in the best entrance economically for us to have healthy, well-cared-for animals. Uh, it's like everything has to be free-range. I don't know. It's like, yeah. Well, if you and if you've ever come against up against a free range sow with her piglets, you're not going to like her very well. And she's gonna, she's gonna let you know that 250 pounds, three feet off the ground, is gonna put you someplace. Yeah. Amen, Malcolm. <laughs> so, <laughs> she's not going to like you very well, too. Intentional killing for food is allowed by God. Yeah. Cannibalism is not. Eating other people is not, uh, not a, a blessed thing by God. Okay. Oh, the Donner Party? When you had to eat people for survival? Yeah, of course. I think survival is survival. I, I think God gives you an exception to keep you alive because <laughs> it's not like you killed them and it's not like, uh, I mean, it's, there's arguments for that. Yeah, me as well. But anyway, I'm going to stop there, shall we? Or do I, Deb's like, one more? I'll do one more. They, they, have, they have cheered me on, folks, to go past the time. Note, nowhere in the scriptures does it support killing of animals for sport. In other words, to kill for the sake of killing or for trophy hunting. It's just not there. Now can I stop? Is it a good stopping place? Uh, I'm going to stop right there anyway. It's, we're, we're three minutes over. So. Plus, Jeff has been trying to stretch things out for me, so I don't have a nervous breakdown trying to do three preps per week. So anyway, hey, and it gives us a chance to just talk out loud about things we've learned tonight, by the way. So, so what are some things that are impactful to you tonight that we, we learned? Uh, what are things that have application for us? All the way back in Genesis chapter 9, by the way. Pat? Um, Pat is asking the question about why God addressed, if I'm understanding Pat right, why God addressed the animals first before the people in the killing. Was it because he created the animals first before people? I don't know. That's a great point. I didn't think about the order of that. (coughs) Possibility, Pat. (coughs) Other thoughts as we close? Thoughts about what we've learned tonight offhand? Very interesting how much this applies, doesn't it, to our world that we live in. It really does. It's amazing. So good. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you. We're just, we're thankful for your kindness to us. And we thank you that scripture gives us guidelines and, and it provokes us to think, Lord. Um, this happened thousands of years ago, Lord, and yet it's so relevant. Uh, it just keeps coming back around. And uh, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, you'll help us to, to have appropriate answers uh, to the questions that might be still lying out there. And so, God, we give you thanks for it. We uh, thank you, Father, for your grace and for your mercy. Uh, thank you for change. Uh, it, it's, uh, change is never easy. Uh, sometimes it's not good, uh, but it's all part of your perfect plan. And that's how we need to look at this chapter as well. Things changed. And it wasn't so good for the animals and it wasn't so good for humanity in general with the diseases and sicknesses that were going to start limiting our life. But there's a plan for that, Lord. And um, and we're so thankful for it. 
So continue to bless us as we study together. Help us to keep asking good questions like tonight. We had good discussion tonight, Lord. I pray that you'll continue to favor us uh, with your spirit's movement, um, helping us to think deeply about things so that we can apply things deeply for the sake of being a follower of Christ. So that we too may have an answer to those who asks, ask us uh, uh, the questions of why we believe the way we believe, not only from salvation, but all the way down to um, why we don't do certain things uh, societally. And so God, we give you thanks. Bless us, Lord, as we go home. Give us safety in our journeys. We ask that you give us wonderful sleep tonight for a rest for tomorrow's um, uh, uh, blessings that will be coming our way and opportunities to share the gospel with people. We just ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, please. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Appreciate it very much.